Hallo. Hey, Blouse. Is this working? Yes. Is that working? Can you hear me? Yes, excellent. I realized uh, I made a terrible mistake. I'm wearing a pencil skirt and I'm on a stool on a dais. <laughs> The stool is the invention of the patriarchy, let's face it. Uh, no woman is comfortable on it. If you see anything you shouldn't see, just shout out, let me know. Uh, I think my public liability insurance covers me for flashing you, and I can pay you compensation for sexual trauma. Hello! Uh, it's so lovely to be back here. I love how this is a recurrent thing, and I just come back here every two years and see you all. Was there anyone here last time I came? Cool, so you've all seen my belly fat and breasts. <laughs> For those who didn't come last time, I've got this thing called my feminist smile, uh, where I talk about how after years of hating my body, and uh, na, 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 I hate my body because of the patriarchy, and na, 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 and now I love my body, and I do this thing where um, I draw eyes on my bra and a nose on my belly, and then I, I flap out my belly over the top of my shorts, and I manipulate my belly rolls into a smile, uh, and my belly fat into a big feminist smile, and my whole body's smiling at you, and it's great and only three people cried because they were scared. Um, <laughs> what was amazing about that is that someone, a photographer was here and sold that picture to the Daily Mail online. I don't know, is it, do you know the Daily, do you have the Daily Mail over here? I guess you know it's evil. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a tool of Satan. Um, and they ran this huge thing about outrageous feminist Catelyn Moran uh, reveals her belly fat to 100 people in a bookstore. And, um, <laughs> And then they do this formulaic thing where at the end of anything, so usually it's a piece about, I don't know, Rihanna's been seen at somewhere and so forth, get the look. And they'll have a whole thing about how you can buy the designer clothes she's wearing. And they did the same thing with me. And it was like, it was a $20 bra with an eye drawn on it. You can't get that anywhere. I made that. That's my genius. Um, so, hello. It's lovely to see you all again. Uh, the book I have written, this book that I'm talking about at the moment, is currently and until tomorrow at least, and we'll find out with the next shots, number one in Britain, hooray! <laughs> My main competition was against Bill Clinton, who's written a very poor thriller, um, <laughs> which inexplicably sold huge amounts in the UK. Um, and so I very shamelessly uh, 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 tweeted a great deal and emailed everybody on my mailing list uh, with the subject title, help me beat off Bill Clinton and get to number one. Um, <laughs> What amazed me was the amount of people who would then on Twitter go, oh, I don't know if you've noticed what you've just said there. It sounded a bit suggestive. Dude, what do you think I do? It's my, it's my job, this is what I do. No gags, that's what I do. Anyway, so the, so the book, How To Be Famous, um, it's the second in what will be a trilogy, um, if this one sells enough. Um, and we're following Johanna Morrigan uh, from her early origins as a 14-year-old working class girl in Wolverhampton who's very under overweight and wants to have a great deal of sex. I don't know where I got that idea from. <laughs> and we're going to follow her all the way through her life. This is the second part, How To Be Famous, whereby she has now moved down to London at the beginning of Britpop, where for two years, everything was amazing in Britain. Uh, it was the second ever biggest uh, cultural revolution that we'd ever had that involved the working classes. There were all these incredible bands. There's Oasis and Blur and Pulp. All these songs were getting in the top 10. Everyone felt very confident. It felt like for two years, uh, there were no winters. It was just en an endless summer that lasted for 24 months. Um, and everybody smoked cigarettes whilst riding around on a vintage bicycle. Um, and we all felt great about ourselves. And then sadly, everyone started taking heroin and Radiohead turned up. But, um, but, for, <laughs> but for two years, it was awesome. And so this book is set during the awesome bit. Um, but even during the awesomeness, bad things happen, and particularly if you are a girl. This was a very male-centered cultural revolution that we were having. Um, and it was the beginning of ironic sexism. Uh, so it would be the beginning of kind of lads being all right, all right, we're lads, we're legendary lads, oi, oi, oi. And their relationship to you as a teenage girl, to me as a teenage girl, would be basically to call me Tits McGee. Um, and then if I was like, that seems a bit sexy, it'd be like, can't you take a joke, Tits McGee? Um, and consequently making me feel angry for about five years. But I waited 20 years and now I have my revenge. Um, <laughs> and the main plot of this is that I wanted to write about sex. Uh, it's not a coincidence that nearly everything I write is dirty and filthy uh, and about disgusting things. So I just don't think we talk about sex enough. How I learned about sex was by reading books when I was a teenage girl. I didn't go to school, I was home educated, I went to the library, I read all these books. And uh, so all the sex education I got generally was from books that worked in some ways. I read the brilliant books of uh, Jackie Collins and Jilly Cooper. They are fruity, they taught me a great deal. Uh, but a lot of the sex that I read was by men 
and, and their descriptions of women and what courtship should be like and what love should be like and what desire was. And that did not work for me as a teenage girl. I would read, for instance, there's that beautiful Raymond Chandler line where he's talking about she was the kind of dame that would make an archbishop kick in a stained glass window. Now, that is a brilliant line. I was just like, fuck, I want to write that line. That's so brilliant. I love you, Raymond Chandler. Except reading that as a 14-year-old girl, still trying to work out what I should be as an adult woman, I was like, shit, is that the kind of woman I've got to be? A dame, the kind of dame that makes men want to destroy architecture. This is... <laughs> I'm just a fat girl in leggings who just fancies a bit of a fumble. This is going to be effortful. Um, Similarly, uh, the books of Ian Fleming, the James Bond books, uh, there's one description that he has in one of the books where he talks about a woman having nipples like, ha um, like hazelnuts. And I found that alarming and disturbing. <laughs> Partially because I got it confused and I thought he meant walnuts. And I was like, that is a hunk of chunk. And uh, secondly, because at the time, my favorite yogurt flavor was hazelnut flavor. And so it meant that every time I ate one, I would feel slightly mournful, but also slightly aroused. And <laughs> That's not what you want when you're 10. Um, so, uh, so what I wanted to write do was write about sex from the female point of view. And these are, I mean, my, my wheelhouse, what I like to do is write about the secret things, the dirty things, the taboo things, anything we're supposed to keep in a corner and keep quiet about. I'm like, hey, no one else is talking about that. That's going to be for me. And we talk so little about sex uh, from a female point of view that we don't have words for it. For instance, there's a bit in this book where Johanna is talking about she's having amazing sex and she gets wet because that's one of the mechanics of sex. And then we realize that there is no name for that fluid. There's no name for that. We've got a million ways that we describe sperm and spath and spooge and spunk and bad tapioca and kind of <laughs> evil tip X. Um, but there's, there's nothing to describe the mechanics of a woman having sex. Um, in the book, um, her, she, the guy that she's having sex with is a guilty Catholic. And uh, he decides in the end that, him, that they should call it uh, the Virgin Mary's guilty tears. Um, uh, but that's still not that much of a solution. Uh, similarly, there aren't words to describe getting turned on. Men have got like, you know, a hard on, you've got a semi, you've got, you've got a chode, you know, you've got, you know, you're a rocket in your pocket. You've got a canoe in your pocket or you just pleased to see me. Uh, women have got wide on, which sounds like a garage door, like kind of, I don't, it's not what I'm trying to convey, like kind of, I, I don't want it to sound capacious, I'm kind of like, you know, it, it's, you know, I don't want it to sound like you can park two or three cars in there, I don't want a wide on. Um, uh, so when I've been doing my tours, I've been asking people to suggest words that we could use. Uh, one of them, oh God, no, of course, there's a language problem here, isn't there? Because one of them suggested fanny fireworks, but... <laughs> That doesn't work for you guys, because that's around the back here. That's just, that's just a gas issue. So now I don't even have fanny fireworks, shit. Um, uh, and so, so lots about sex. We talk about uh, good sex, we talk about bad sex. Uh, one of the good sexes that I wanted to talk about was um, uh, a man losing his virginity to a woman. Because we read so much about uh, women losing their virginity to men. That's one of the big sexes that we see written about time after time. And I've never understood why we really go on about that as a culture. Because the first time you have sex as a girl, that's usually one of the bad sexes or not the not great sexes. Uh, you know, there's the blood, there's the pain, there's the chafing. Uh, there's the terrible fear of getting pregnant, uh, even though you've made him put on six condoms <laughs> and come in the bathroom <laughs> inside a sleeping bag. Um, you will still be very scared. Uh, whereas... When, you ha when a boy loses his virginity, that's a much easier, that's, you know, there's not as much, to, that's, that's an easier one, there's, there's not as much fear, you're the one who's, you know, you're the experienced lady, you're here helping this guy out, that's going to be fun. I like to think about what persona that I've got uh, in the times that I have deflowered a man. Uh, for me, I'm some kind of 19th century strumpet, um, <laughs> some kind of good time girl, I live in my farm up in yonder hills. Um, uh, the time has come to take my pigs to market. Uh, so I've got a pig under each arm as I walk down into the village. Uh, there's a fair on. I sell my pigs at the fair. I've got my pig money. <laughs> I buy my cider. I have a drink. I see a shy young man in the field where the wheat has been sheaved. Um, we go and have sex and he's very grateful. And that's mainly what I'm looking for in a sexual partner. Um, <laughs> Mel, out of Mel and Sue, who present the Great British Bake Off, uh, was, was once asked what she looks for in a sexual partner, and she said gratitude. And I was like, yeah, that is correct. That is, <laughs> that is primarily what you want. It's not that difficult. Um, so we talk a great deal about sex in the book. And then we talk about, so we talk about uh, taking a man's virginity. Uh, we talk about, uh, there's, a, there's an, 
what I've tried to do is write the best shag of all time ever in there. At one point, I won't say where because I'll give away the plot. Um, I'm still waiting for my husband to read this book, so uh, <laughs> every time I come back, I'm kind of like, as I walk through the door, if I, I'm like, has he got to that bit yet? Because we're going to have an amazing shag tonight. Still nothing. So <laughs> it's hidden in, hidden in plain view. Um, and then the main driver of the plot is bad sex. And this is a, a you know, and it, the whole point of writing this book uh, was I'd, I'd come up with a plot 10 years ago, and it's about a girl who goes and has willing consensual sex with a man, but it becomes icky and a bit shit and bad. So we're not talking about criminal in a Me Too way, but Me Too is criminal stuff, that is stuff you will go to court for. What we're talking about is a whole other arena of stuff that recent things like the Cat Person essay and the Aziz Ansari thing have brought to our attention, which is like, if these are not criminal acts, this is shit, shit sex. This is people who do not know what they're doing. This is, this is where we need to be having, this is where culture really needs to step in, where men and women need to be able to start talking about what they want from sex, what is good, what is bad, uh, where you're crossing a line. So we've always got some kind of peer review that we come up with culturally about what good sex and what bad sex is. I suggested that this should be a website and we should call it Dick Advisor. <laughs> and this would be a good way of learning what we do and don't like. Um, but this is the driver of the plot. Uh, she has this, this sex that is not illegal, but is unpleasant. Um, and then there are subsequent consequences to this. She realizes that he has filmed it and he is now showing it to people. So she's being sexually shamed. This is revenge porn. And I wanted to write this because I was like, what would you do if this happened to you? What would you do if you are one person and something that you have done willingly and joyfully and gleefully is now been turned into something that is shaming you. You are being made to feel bad about this, even though you have done nothing wrong. How can one girl fight back against one powerful, in this book, he's a famous, powerful man. And the device that I found to do this, I was so happy about, but I can't tell you because it's the big plot twist. Um, but since it came out in the, in the in UK last week, I have had 50 women a day tweeting me going, oh my God, I've got to that chapter. I've seen what happened. I am standing on a chair. Like, you have come to save us. This is amazing. This is blowing my mind. I wish I'd had this when I was a teenager. And this is all I want to do. I always, you know, the whole point for me of writing a book is that you are, that it should be useful. You should get to the end of this book. You should have been entertained. You should have laughed. Hopefully you'd be quite turned on on the good shags. Uh, but it should also be useful. You should know what to do in the future if these things happen to you. This is the point of culture for me. We pass these informations on. And in that spirit, um, I have uh, written a description of uh, how you can know, how you can, how you can identify very early on a bad man. There are a lot of bad men out there. What I really needed as a teenage girl when I came down to London with my heart and my legs open um, <laughs> was for someone to take me to one side and maybe pull down some kind of map and go, <laughs> okay, the bad men are here and the good men are here and this is how you will identify them. Uh, but sadly, no one ever does this for you, so I will now tell you how to identify a bad man. So oh, the bad man is called Jerry Sharp. He's a young, sexy rock and roll comedian. Uh, and he's not based on anyone famous that I used to know at all. <laughs> I know that because there's a legal disclaimer at the front of the book. It's, so he could not in any way be based on someone that I knew at that time. In later years, when I'm having a long lunch with some girlfriends and we take it in turns to talk about the worst men in the world, they come up with a list of things that, if you see them in a man's flat, tip you off that you are in the presence of a bad man. As they point out, whilst drinking wine and howling with laughter, Jerry Sharp's flat had the full set. A framed John Coltrane poster. A framed Betty Blue poster. <laughs> A bookshelf filled with Hunter S. Thompson, Nietzsche, Jack Kerouac, Henry Miller, and books about the Third Reich. <laughs> Several hats. This is key. Very often, more often than not, a man wearing a hat is like a brilliant, easy to recognize sign across the room at a party, like they put a lid of evil on top of their heads, <laughs> so you may easily identifiable and simply walk away from them. That man in the hat accepted. That's a, that's a nice hat. I like that hat. Because you're here, and that makes you a good man. That hat should say good man on it. A velvet frock coat, 
This is another really important thing. A man who's wearing a long, flowing, romantic velvet frock coat thinks he is a tortured poet. You do not want to go out with a tortured poet. Your life is, yes, the lady who went out with a tortured poet. Lady, I hear you. Yep, abs absolutely not. Poetry should be a private matter, a slightly shameful matter, and I don't want to know anything about it. <laughs> Particularly not when I'm trying to breastfeed a child. Get away from me. An angry looking cat and a litter tray full of cat shit. Some ironic Virgin Marys. The complete works of both the Fall and Frank Zappa. Frank Zappa is a huge sign, I have to say. If you haven't found this out yet, I tell you now. Big Frank Zappa fan, walk out the door, climb out of a window, go up a chimney if you need to. A pile of pornography, a bottle of absinthe, and a coffee table with noticeable scratch marks from chopping out cocaine. Any woman, when she sees these things, must run, my friends conclude, laughing and crying at the same time, because this is the house of a man who hates women. And they are correct. However, because I'm still only 18 at the time and have yet to learn this, I just think, cool, an edgy intellectual. <laughs> now, what you don't want is an edgy intellectual. Here's what you want. A man with a physique like that of, say, Santa Claus or Mark Ruffalo after a good Christmas. <laughs> he will be wearing a cardigan. He will be playing easily accessible adult orientated rock. And when you come home, he will say, I've just put a baked potato in. It'll be ready in an hour. Shall I go down on you until it's ready? <laughs> Reader, I married him. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.